Hello, good afternoon. My name is uh, Koen van Aller. I'm uh, from Belgium, born in uh, Bruges and living in Ghent. I'm working at Listerius. Listerius is a platinum company in uh, Europe. We have offices in Belgium, the Netherlands, France, um, Spain and Portugal. And I'm responsible for our hosting division. And a big part of our services is managing um, FileMaker servers that were set up in the infrastructure of the clients themselves. Um, before we start, um, who of you is an in-house developer? Yeah, a couple of them. And who is thinking of putting his FileMaker server somewhere in the clouds? Yeah. Um, then you will recognize in the following story. We will follow a fictive uh, company called Clip Factory. And Clip Factory is uh, making the first, uh, the first internet connected uh, paperclip. And um, this is Eric, a young workplace uh, innovator. And he developed a custom app for his colleagues to manage the contracts and so on for FileMaker Pro and WebDirect. And he goes to his boss, shows off his products, and his boss is very proud. Congratulations, I want to use it. Can I use it at, at home? Can we use it uh, at the customers? Um, and then Eric starts thinking, oh, I forgot something. I forgot the deployment. I have to do something I'm not familiar with. I have to find a solution to um, make my application uh, connected. So there are a couple of questions he needs to answer. First of all, where do I put my hosting? Where do I put my files? Big part of security is a physical place. Second, is it secure? I'm not skilled at all in security and, and managing servers and that kind of stuff. And especially if you read a little bit the newspapers, you see that the number of uh, vulnerabilities in software is increasing every year. And the same for data breaches. These are the numbers of data breaches in the US. And you see the growth. And you had uh, the issue of Capital One uh, last week, um, which shows uh, the impact of the, all these breaches. And it could be your data. So this is a, a figure. 14 billion, almost 15 billion records were lost or stolen since 2013 in the US alone. That makes about 74 records per second. During my session, somewhere 300,000 records will be lost. So Eric starts his journey. Oh no, what have I done? Yeah. So this is a setting. How do I start? Let's find first an answer on the where. Where do I put my hosting? First thing you can do, and that's what most of the people started off, is in-house. This has big pros. You have full control over your server. There's low latency for your users, so it's very fast for your local users. But you have to invest heavily in infrastructure and security in a server room. You have to arrange phys physical access. You see a lot of places still where you just see some of the Mac Mini on the table. And this is a server, so everyone can uh, come in and uh, take the machine and uh, run out. And you have to invest a lot in, uh, in maintenance as well, if you want to do it right. Second option is going to a data center. So you don't have to invest in hardware and, and in infrastructure. That's all done by your uh, data center uh, thing. They do monitoring. They look if there are no vulnerabilities in the network. Um, and you have full control over your FileMaker server in this case. The cons is. There are limited responsibilities uh, for the data center. Everything you do on the FileMaker server is still your responsibility. So you have to manage your FileMaker server. You have to, in most cases, manage the operating system. So you have to learn a big part of that skills as well. And there are a lot of data centers. Which one should you use, uh, choose? Two steps in that uh, choosing. Well, first you have the latency. Don't go for the cheapest one. But look also where the data center is, is uh, situated. So if you're from the East Coast, don't choose the data center on the West Coast. If you're from Europe, don't choose the data center in, uh, in the US. Yeah. Second is 
choosing a data center is looking to um, safety and policies the data center has. Is it a tier one, two, three, or four data center? That means uh, how the electricity is arranged, for instance. Do they have ISO certifications? Is the physical access arranged, or is it just in someone's kitchen? Um, is it compliant with your industry? So if you're a, a HIPAA compliant or GDPR compliant, if you're using a European uh, um, pri uh, uh, private data. So the next option we have is a FileMaker hosting partner. They're using the same data centers as you would go directly, but they have knowledge and expertise of FileMaker. They can help you out with the typical FileMaker questions, and they most often offer what, what is called managed hosting. They do all the hard work for you. But that could also be a disadvantage, because if you want full control over your environment and you give that to a partner, um, then you don't have that uh, control anymore. And you have, often have a uh, higher cost as well. How to choose? FileMaker has a, a great website where they put a lot of uh, hosting partners in there. Um, watch out for some uh, red alerts. If they're still offering shared hosting, which has stopped since FileMaker 14, this should be an, uh, a red alert because that's hosting on old hardware, on old uh, operating systems, and on old FileMaker servers, which contains vulnerabilities. A couple of years ago, FileMaker came with FileMaker Cloud for AWS. The process, it's defined, the security and the setup is defined by FileMaker Inc. So you are almost assured that everything is tested very well. It's hosted on a reliable uh, data center with all the certifications you need. Um, and the management is quite simple. But for non uh, um, users that are not uh, used to uh, go into the uh, environment of AWS, it, it could look in the beginning very uh, complex. You have all that kind of services, all that kind of uh, um, uh, places to, to look for. And there's also a variable cost, so it's difficult to uh, to predict upfront your costs of the hosting. And there's limited support. You have to figure out everything yourself. Yeah? A disadvantage of FileMaker Cloud for AWS is that it's also end of life. But there's good news. FileMaker just showed this morning FileMaker Cloud 2.0. The same advantages as uh, FileMaker Cloud for AWS, but some extra things. They have the SSL, for instance, included. You don't have to bother buying your SSL certificate. Um, the, the management is simple. FileMaker gives 100% support on that uh, area. You have the FileMaker ID, which you have seen this morning, to log in. And the, the same is used for your users to log in into your FileMaker solutions. And uh, it, fix, it fits completely in the strategy of FileMaker with Cloud First, so you get the new, uh, the new uh, functionality first. Some advantages could be if you still have a solution running all the technology, this is not supported by uh, FileMaker Cloud. If you don't want to use FileMaker ID for your credentials, uh, then you cannot use uh, FileMaker Cloud as well for the time being. And it's not in the market yet. So if you want to start today, uh, that can be a, a little bit difficult. So we have five options. Um, would we go for FileMaker uh, Go uh, clouds? My session would be very short, so uh, Eric decides to go for a data center. Yeah. So what do we need? Before um, Eric can start. First of all, he needs a server with an operating system. You need a FileMaker server installation software and a license key or license certificate. He needs a domain name, a registered public domain name that he owns by himself. He needs a DNS server. He needs an FQDN, that's the full name of your uh, FileMaker server. He needs an SSL certificate. And he needs, of course, a secured FileMaker solution. You can have a very secure server, but if your FileMaker solution is insecure, your FileMaker server security isn't worth nothing. 
So let's have, let's have a look to uh, a server with an operating system. Most um, data centers offer three options. First one is colocation, where you have to buy your own hardware and put that in a data center. You could also ha um, have a dedicated server. That means that they have the hardware and you rent it and you get full control over that uh, hardware. Or today, a VPS. And a VPS is today the most um, logic uh, choice. It's expandable. You can have snapshots before you do uh, upgrades. Um, there are failover systems in case of hardware is failing. Um, the OS is uh, often included, so you don't have to buy your own uh, OS. It's most of the time included. And a lot of these uh, VPSs are based on uh, the latest and fastest uh, SSD uh, disks. So Eric has chosen for a VPS. So he has to start preparing his operating system. First thing, after installing uh, the Windows software, he has to open some ports to be available for hosting. So these are the ports in the documentation. Uh, put only open the ports that you need. Yeah? So if you don't gonna use XDBC, don't open that port. If you have a multi-machine set up, you have to open board, uh, port 16002 between the multiple machines, and it means only between the multiple machines. These ports shouldn't be open from outside. Yeah? And close a new port. Next, if you want to manage your uh, machine, you have to take over the machine. And one of the most popular software is Remote Desktop Connection. And we see often that a lot of our customers just open that connection, open in the cloud, never do that. Close that port, close that connection. Always use uh, access over VPN or SSA uh, gateways or um, the key VM. Oh, most often there's a console uh, uh, that you can use to manage your, uh, your server. Just to have an idea um, how cheap it is, there's an article from a while ago. It only cost uh, the price of a beer in this hotel to get access to somewhere uh, a machine uh, on the internet. So next step, installing the uh, FileMaker server. First thing you have to do is to install, choose an admin console, a root account. This is the account that you need to manage your FileMaker server, and that's also the only account that can have access to the uh, uh, FileMaker admin API. So don't use admin, use an alternative long uh, uh, username and also use a strong password. Don't use uh, 1234. Yeah. Um, and also the recover pin is to be able, if you ever lose your uh, password, you can recover your password on the local machine alone. Uh, and here you can enter a, a recover pin for that. Don't give that to your colleagues. If you're managing with multiple users a FileMaker server, don't share that login and password. You can add multiple users by using external authentication to manage that FileMaker server uh, as well. There are a lot of steps you can uh, uh, set up on a FileMaker server, but next step for Eric is installing a custom SSL. Um, who have ever purchased an SSL? Yeah. And who have ever installed an SSL certificate on a FileMaker server without failing? Yeah. It's hard, eh? Or it looks hard. And this is not FileMaker's fault. So we're first going to look what is SSL about, what is an SSL certificate, and what problem does it solve. So if we look to um, TLS, which is in fact the current word for SSL, SSL is something from the past. So uh, TLS stands for uh, Transport Layer Security. Um, most people think that's only about encryption. Encryption, the transport between the FileMaker clients and the server, between the browser and the web server. But that's only a small part of, uh, of the function of TLS. I don't know who was in Clay's session uh, yesterday, yeah, because he had it already about um, plugins and how to code design. Well, code designing is in fact the same uh, uh, the same as TLS. 
First problem it solves is to be sure that the server you're going to is owned by the party that tells that the server is. For instance, if you uh, go to um, apple.com, you want to be sure that the domain is owned by Apple. Yeah? Next one is, um, he does the encryption of the transport layer. He verifies also the integrity of the data to be sure that what has been uh, uh, coming from the server is in fact the same as what, what you receive on your client. That no man in the middle is changing uh, that data. And he also verifies the authenticity to be sure that the data you receive is coming from that server. Yeah? And, but uh, the most important part is uh, the validation part because you need that to buy a certificate. So the validation is how do you know that the domain name belongs to the clip factory? And that validation is guaranteed by the certificate authority. And the certificate authority is a third party trusted by the client, we as a user, and the one that is the owner of the server, which is, in this case, the clip factory. Um, and that's the companies where you buy your uh, SSL certificate. And they all have to follow certain rules. And these rules are uh, defined by the CA browser forum. Um, so that's why a self-signed certificate can never guarantee that validation. Yeah? You can easily uh, do, uh, create your own SSL certificates, but that only uh, fixes the uh, issue of uh, encryption, but not the validation uh, part. And there are several levels of validation. If you go to the website of an SSL, uh, of a certificate authority, you will see that you can choose between domain validation, organization validation, and extended validation. Domain validation uh, means that only the domain is validated. He only checks that the domain belongs to you. Yeah? And he does that by checking the US records, by checking your DNS uh, records, etc. So. These are often very cheap yeah? or free, like uh, Let's Encrypt. Um, but often, organizations need a higher level of validation, and that's where the uh, certificate authority starts uh, validating your organization. So they're checking that your organization is really existing. You have to uh, approve with uh, papers. They call you physically with the phone number that they find back in official uh, lists, uh, and so on. And extended validation is almost the same, but they do extra checks as well, and in case of uh, um, a failure on the side of a certificate authority, you get more money. I never heard anyone that received money from a uh, certificate authority, but it's like an insurance company. Yeah? So, um, first we have the validation that is done by the certificate authority, but an important role and an important part is what is called the chain of trust. And I, I try to explain this uh, very simple. If we go to a server, default one, and we say on the SSL part, no, yeah? like what most people do in the beginning, um, you see two certificates, in fact, and they are not trusted. There's a red uh, uh, spot on it. So why is this? Yeah? If I install my uh, certificate, I see three certificates. What are these three certificates, and why are they valid? How does Farmaker server know? How does my Farmaker Pro know? And this is valid. So let's um, go back to uh, uh, the clip factory. And this is Emma. And Emma is a contract manager of the clip factory, and she will sign a contract with Apple to sign that uh, internet connected uh, Clippy in the Apple stores. So she's very excited. And she will sign the contract with Jack. And uh, Jack is working at Apple, but hmm, she doesn't trust it very well. Hey, wait, who says that you can sign that contract with me? Do you have the authority to sign that contract with me? Yeah. How can I trust him? Well, check some in. Okay, this is my proof. This is my authority, signed by a DQ. Okay, and a DQ is working uh, at Apple. But uh, she doesn't know uh, a DQ. I never heard of him. How can I trust? EDQ. And then come the EDQ on. Oh, 
I have also a certificate, an authority signed by uh, Tim Cook. Yeah? And then, then Tim Cook comes in. Okay, I'm the CEO of Apple, and I have now my authority signed by myself. Yeah? Okay. These are three documents she received from uh, Jack. Okay. So Emma's happy, she knows Tim Cook, she trusts Tim Cook and says, okay, we can start uh, talking. This is in fact exactly the same process that happens when you uh, communicate with your FileMaker server or with your browser. There are also three certificates going over and you trust uh, the certificate. It's called the chain of trust. So because Emma trusts uh, Tim Cook, she also trusts uh, Eddie Q, and on this side, she trusts uh, uh, Jackie, which is in uh, the root, which is the Tim Cook uh, certificate. The intermediate is the Eddie Q certificate signed by Tim Cook, and then you have the Leaf certificate, that's one you buy, that is signed by um, Eddie Q for Jackie. If you have a chain of trust, you also have a chain of uh, distrust. If you don't uh, trust uh, Pontius Pilatus, you will not trust Judas, and you will not trust uh, Jackie at all. So there are two levels of certificate authorities. You have certificate authorities that are the root certificate authorities, just like GoDaddy, DigiCert, and then you have intermediate uh, certificate authorities, which could be the same, the root authorities, GoDaddy, DigiCert, but for instance, GeoTrust is not a root certificate authority, it's an intermediate. And it could be your local uh, hosting provider that uh, gives you certificates. They are most of the time signed by other well-known uh, root certificates. So you find that back on your FileMaker server. So you see here the, the Tim Cook version, yeah? the DigiCert uh, root certificate, the intermediate certificates, and then the one you have bought. Am I smart? But um, how does this trust work? Because as, as me as a user, I never told uh, on my computer that uh, I trust uh, Tim Cook. And this is in fact done by your um, by the vendors. Yeah? It's done by uh, Apple, it's done by Microsoft coming up with regular updates, they're installing uh, uh, these uh, root certificates on your machine, and they validate and trust it for you. Um, but it's also included in uh, applications like uh, FileMaker, it's built in. FileMaker has a list of certificate authorities of uh, root certificates that are built in in the software. And if on a certain moment you don't trust, DigiCert, you can even disable it. You can say, I, never tr I don't trust anymore these uh, certificate uh, authorities. Um, don't play with it. Don't add certificate uh, 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 root certificates within your FileMaker uh, uh, folders. It will, break, uh, um, it will break code assigning. You see some uh, developers uh, suggesting this for uh, custom uh, certificates. So we, bought a cert uh, we will buy a certificate, so how do we install it? Um, what do we need? In the first place, you cannot buy an, um, as a certificate if you don't own a public domain name. Yeah? You must be the owner of a public domain name. Um, you must have an FQDN or define an uh, FQDN, which is the full name of your uh, FileMaker server, so in this case, fms.theclipfactory.com. Um, you need to have a complete US record of your domain. That's where the ownership of the uh, domain name is and defined. And be sure it's complete, especially the phone number, if you will want to do a domain validation. Um, for the domain validation, uh, you need a DNS server, web server, uh, uh, link to the FQDN, or access to uh, certain uh, email addresses. Otherwise, you will not be able to buy that uh, certificate. In case of an organization validation, you need a lot of paperwork and, and uh, be able to, uh, to answer a phone call. And we need FileMaker Server or other tools like uh, OpenSSL. So what does FileMaker Server need? It needs in the first place a leaf certificate. We have to give them an intermediate certificate, ADQ, and a private key. 
and a pr private uh, passphrase. What is a private key? Well, it's simple, it's a text file. Um, and it's, um, it's something used to do digital uh, signatures. Yeah? And it's private, so you have to keep it for yourself. But you also needed to be able to create that uh, SSL certificate. Uh, and because you should not give that private uh, certificate to your uh, certificate authority, they invented something that is called a CSR file. And a CSR file is, in fact, a certificate signing request document, where you put in all the information about the, uh, uh, the certificate you want to buy, your organization, your uh, domain name, uh, but also a key, a public key, that is included in your uh, uh, CSR file that will be used by the certificate authority to sign your certificate. Yeah. How do you generate? There's an, a comment line in uh, the FileMaker server, which is, by the way, broken with the latest version of uh, FileMaker 18 server update. Um, but there's an alternative. That's the one we always use. It's OpenSSL. It's standard uh, installed on a Mac. Uh, and um, you can easily install it on a Windows uh, uh, server. And you have to do a comment and then fill in all the details. You don't have to do that on your future FileMaker server. You can do it on your own machine. Yeah? It's, uh, I see a lot of, uh, of our customers that are thinking they can only generate that CSR file on the FileMaker server themselves. No, you can do it just locally. The moment you do, he generates a private key and your uh, CSR file. So this is a screenshot. And then you can buy uh, your certificates. Yeah? And the list is a little bit outdated because Symantec doesn't provide any uh, uh, SSL certificates uh, anymore. They blew up the rules of the uh, CA browser. Um, but in fact, most SSL certificates that are on the market are compatible with FileMaker 18 and FileMaker 17 server. Yeah? So it doesn't have to be the one that is tested in, in this list. So then you can buy a certificate, then you have to upload that CSR file. Never generate a CSR file on an online website, because if you do, they know your private key, and uh, they shouldn't know your private key. So uh, always do it locally. If you choose an option, what kind of certificate? Choose always others. Yeah, that will probably be the one that uh, matches your FileMaker server. First problem can occur when you upload that. You get a very strange um, message on the, CA, on, your, uh, on the website, pre-sign failed. And what this pre-sign failed means, that means that in your, on your DNS server, they specified that you can only buy certificates at a certain CA vendor, for instance, um, Sectigo. And that can be a, pol a company policy that you can only buy uh, um, certificates at Sectigo. So if you want then buy a certificate at GoDaddy, you have to add GoDaddy as well to uh, your DNS server and that CAA record, or you have to, um, and you, most of the time you have to ask to your IT department, or you buy a certificate at um, at Sectigo or the one that is allowed. Yeah? Could be problem number one if you buy an uh, SSL certificate. And they don't give that information. You only see that uh, strange error on top of it. Second, the validation process. So when you receive, uh, when you want to buy an SSL certificate, uh, they're going to check your domain. And they do that on, 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 can do that on three uh, levels because your FileMaker server is maybe not even in the cloud or not set up yet. So you can do that by adding a TXT record in, on your DNS server, uh, adding a file on the website if your FileMaker server is already uh, installed, or an email address sent to the contact that is in your US record, or hostmaster, postmaster uh, email address. So you must have access to one of these three to be able to buy an SSL certificate. And that's often an issue in a lot of larger companies. So you need help from your uh, IT department in this. With an organization and extended validation, you also have to prove your uh, existence of your uh, company. So 
Everything went fine. We import the SSL certificate, so we put here the leaf certificate. They're the intermediate you also receive from your uh, CA uh, vendor. And we upload our private key that we generated on our own machine and the passphrase. Sometimes we receive from our IT department uh, or from the vendor uh, the certificates in the wrong format. You don't have to reissue your certificate. You can easily migrate with uh, OpenSSL that certificate to the correct uh, format. And these are two commands uh, that you can use for this. And then you do it. And then this happens. You get still that warning. What could have been go wrong? So first error, most common error, people are still, still using the IP address to connect to their FileMaker server, or they're using the wrong FQDN. So you bought an SSL certificate with a certain uh, name, but in fact, you're logging in with another name, or you have installed the wrong uh, SSL certificate. So to solve this, uh, always use the correct uh, FQDN, yeah? And block or disable uh, Bonjour if you do it in your local network so that your user is not connecting VIP uh, addresses to your FileMaker server. Next error can be your certificate is expired. So the maximum length of uh, an SSL certificate you can buy is uh, two years. Yeah. So buy a new one. The most common problem is that you forgot to uh, upload your uh, uh, intermediate uh, inter SSL, uh, your intermediate certificate. So um, if you have a browser and go to a website that doesn't have the intermediate uh, certificate uh, uh, installed, it is not an issue because your browser is automatically loading that uh, intermediate certificate from the uh, certificate authority. But FileMaker Server doesn't do that. So you have to be sure that you install the correct intermediate uh, certificate uh, as well. Um, an incomplete chain, sometimes Domains can be, uh, SSL certificates can also be cross-signed. Uh, that means that they are also signed by, not only by Tim Cook, but by uh, uh, um, another, maybe um, uh, another organization as well. So multiple organizations can sign that uh, same certificate. And they do that for uh, compatibility. So this year we had a new certificate of uh, Sectigo, a new root certificate of Sectigo, and older Windows machines didn't know that uh, certificate. And so they used instead the alternative uh, chain of trust, but FileMaker Server does not know anything about that uh, alternative chain of trust. So you have to be sure that your uh, root certificate is uh, installed on your client machines. This is a nice one from a customer. We had a man in the middle. Um, so the SSL certificate we received in the FileMaker client was different than the one that was installed on the FileMaker server. And this security software, well, security software, um, that wants to scan all the, uh, uh, all the uh, information in your, uh, in your encrypted uh, environment. But since it's encrypted, you cannot go in there. So what does that uh, uh, security software? It replaces the SSL certificate in the middle. So the only uh, option is to install this uh, security software. In this case, it was Kaspersky. Yeah. Um, these are the most often uh, issues we have seen, but there are plenty of more. And if you don't find it, and really don't find what the issue is, you can do a command from your machine to your FileMaker server. And this is the command, and it gives back an, an error, the exact error of the uh, SSL problem. And most often, he tells you what, what is wrong. It could be your intermediate is wrong, or uh, uh, a bad format or uh, one of the other options uh, I've showed. So it's an, a good uh, comment line to uh, troubleshoot your uh, TLS connections. So Eric thinks he's ready. And while he was uh, looking on the uh, community forum, he stumbled on this uh, uh, little article. Someone has done everything what you have done and uh, a client had a security audit from externally and had an issue. Even if they have uh, installed everything with the latest software and the latest uh, things, and it starts like this. I will not read it completely, just pick out some uh, 
words of it. Uh, it starts with SSL TLS service supports TLS v1.0, the server side is blah, 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 and then something about weakness and man in the middle and poodles and beasts, yeah, poodles on your Farmaker server, um, and it goes further. Uh, TLS v1 is no longer compatible when uh, applying to NIST and PCI DSS, which is for, uh, for uh, Visa card uh, um, information uh, storage. Um, so does it mean that Farmac server is not compliant with all these uh, um, um, uh, options? And then it goes further, and then his head starts to spin because it's going about TLS v1 and block ciphers and IES and a lot of uh, uh, complex uh, wording, typical things you receive back from an uh, IT department. So um, Eric is becoming afraid. Oh, no. I did everything following the book, but I have done something wrong. It looks like Farmica server is uh, not safe enough. So let's talk about uh, TLS. And I will keep it very simple, yeah, because can be very uh, complex. You have to know that TLS comes in versions. And the more recent the version, the safer, in general. So FileMaker Server is using TLS 1.2. TLS 1.3 is new, brand new and only uh, released uh, last year. Yeah? And encryption goes with keys. And not only with one key, but with a combination of keys and, and methods. And there are two kinds of keys. Sym symmetric keys and asymmetric keys. Symmetric keys are keys. You use the same key to encrypt and decrypt your uh, message. Yeah? And then you, you see the same terminology, SC4, DES3, DES, IS, are methods of uh, symmetric keys. And asymmetric keys is that you use another key to encrypt than to decrypt. If you start reading about it, my head starts spinning. So, uh, <laughs> Uh, it's a little bit complex, but it's the RSI and uh, DH, and that's where private key and public keys come in. And they don't use uh, one method, they use multiple methods, yeah? uh, combined. And that combination they call a cipher suite. And some cipher suites are safe, and some become unsafe. So it could be that Farmic server is now using a cipher suite that is for everyone safe, and next month they find an issue, and they have to invalidate that. And you have to keep that up to date. So how is it? How safe is FileMaker Server and TLS? To understand, this is the communication that happens between the client and the server. And there are two pieces of software involved. First of all, you have the FileMaker Server software, which uh, is the communication between FileMaker Pro and, uh, and the client. You have the XDBC uh, communication. And then you have the communication between the web server, Apache or IS, and the client, used for WebDirect, but also used for your streaming containers. So let's have a look to Farmic Server. Farmic Server is using TLS 1.2 and a recent cipher. So we are good. Farmic Server has done very well. So you maybe remember when we have to switch with an update from FileMaker 14 or 13 v9, and then you couldn't connect anymore with the old clients to the new clients. Well, that was the switch when we went over from an old TLS version to the new uh, TLS uh, 1.2 version. Same for XDBC. XDBC uses exactly the same uh, communication uh, and, and, and ciphers as uh, uh, the one from uh, FileMaker Pro. Then you have on Mac, Apache, and FileMaker is doing well as well. This is also TLS 1.2, and if you want to fiddle with it, these are the two uh, documents you can a little bit uh, tweak uh, your, uh, your ciphers that you will support. Yeah? But then we are on Windows. Um, and what's in the documentation on FileMaker? The cipher type is controlled by Windows OS and uh, IES web server. So FileMaker has no control over it. You have to do it by yourself. Yeah? And you hope Microsoft is doing uh, very well. If you have a look to some machines that are still used for FileMaker server in the cloud, you will see that some of them using recent and safe uh, TLS versions, 
And these are standard configurations. So you see that our Windows Server 2016 or 2012 still uh, support TLS v.1, but also support TLS uh, 1.2. Yeah? But they didn't have disabled it because older uh, clients could uh, not connect. So this is one of the things that that guy on the, on the forum had. FileMaker is using TLS uh, 1.2 but your operating system is still supporting an old, older version of, uh, of TLS as well. So you have to disable it. How can you test your FileMaker server? You can do this with uh, external software. There are good websites to test your uh, TLS uh, SSL uh, settings, and they give a rating to it. And the best rating you can get is an A+. It's the score you get by default on FileMaker Cloud, for instance. And these are some um, tests we have done on uh, random uh, machines with default configurations. Uh, and depending on the age uh, you have, you get the F rating, which is the lowest rating. And where you see the Cs, even there you can have on some older machines that are not up to date an F rating. That means that your server is very vulnerable. Yeah? So you should have an honest rating of an A or an A plus on your uh, FileMaker server at least. The standard Windows Server 2016, you get an A rating. So how can you patch this? Um, typical Microsoft, the Windows registry. Yeah? So you have to patch it and uh, define which versions of TLS you, uh, uh, you will uh, offer, uh, and also which uh, cipher suite you will enable uh, uh, in your, uh, on your machine. Luckily, there is software available where, with presets that are um, very well defined, and software from Nartic, where you can define it on a, uh, and where you can uh, set this up uh, on a user-friendly uh, way. And they have uh, templates uh, available that are PSI, uh, DSS enabled, or uh, compliant, or NIST compliant, and so on. It's something you have to do on your FileMaker server, eh? especially on Windows. Yeah? How do you know? Because that changes often. Mozilla does a very good job in uh, uh, defining uh, good configurations for uh, uh, TLS and, and cipher suits, and they publish it publicly. Unfortunately, they don't have templates for uh, Windows, but you can see how they do it for Apache, uh, and you can use the same cipher suits uh, in, uh, uh, in Windows as well. Okay? So, Everything is installed fine on the, on the FileMaker server. Next thing we need is a secure uh, FileMaker solution, because you can have a safe FileMaker server, but if your solution is uh, um, very bad to secure, then your uh, security on the server means nothing. So this is a very, there was a session this week uh, earlier about uh, uh, securing your solution. So I go very fast. This is a little bit like in a, a small uh, a checklist. So first, never build your own operating, uh, your own uh, security system. Only use the FileMaker security, build in security. Don't make extra layers. Every extra layer you add on the security of FileMaker makes your solution unsafe. Yeah? So uh, if you want to use two-factor authentication, use uh, OAuth. Never build your own uh, uh, solution in there. Never use uh, guest users, especially not on the cloud. You have to know always who is entering your FileMaker uh, solution. So no anonymous uh, access. Um, to be sure that the guest is disabled, you can upload your file in the secure folder on the FileMaker server. And by default, FileMaker server will disable the uh, guest account. No anonymous access, so give every user his own login and uh, credentials. And the credentials, the password, should only be known by the, by the users. So uh, no IT uh, guy in the company should have a list of passwords of his users uh, somewhere in his pocket. We see that often uh, if we go to customers. They have to use a strong password, and to be sure that they use a, a strong password, OAuth is your uh, best friend. Yeah? Um, restrict access from uh, older versions. Older versions often have some uh, vulnerabilities, like uh, the hacks via the data viewer and so on. So if you 
Arnold FileMaker 18 with everyone in the company, restrict your uh, solution to FileMaker 18 uh, only, or a minimum uh, requirement. You can do this in the file options. Yeah? Um, extend the privilege sets. This gives access to uh, um, to FileMaker app, to IW, uh, to WebDirect, to uh, custom web publishing, only enable the one you need. So if you have a PHP user that doesn't need uh, FileMaker uh, Pro access, give them only uh, PHP access and never give them uh, FMAP access. It's easy to, uh, to debug, but uh, uh, don't do that. File access, which is now by default enabled in FileMaker 18 uh, at last, uh, do this so that you know who is connecting, uh, which files are connecting to your, uh, to, to, to your FileMaker server, that it cannot be used to hack or to go into a, 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 a table you don't want to uh, give direct access to. So enable this, uh, this feature if you're uh, still having uh, all the solutions. Always use secure storage for your containers. Uh, external containers as a storage option, not a sharing option. Um, and if you put it on a FileMaker server um, where uh, system administrators or hosting providers have access to, then they can look into your uh, PDF files or in your uh, um, image files. And they should not have access to this. And to uh, prevent this, always use your uh, uh, secure storage uh, in the cloud. An important one, one that is required on FileMaker Cloud as well. Um, use encryption at rest, always. So if an employee or someone else has an old backup of a file where he had access in in the past, he cannot enter that uh, solution if he has a copy, a local copy. He first needs to know the uh, encryption password first. So always uh, encrypt it and never lose your encryption password, otherwise you cannot uh, enter your FileMaker solution anymore. Just to be sure, if you upload to the FileMaker server, use the secure folder. It's not more secure to host it there, but there is an extra check, the same checks that FileMaker Cloud is doing. FileMaker Cloud is checking if you have used encryption at rest and uh, disables uh, guest accounts. And that happens if you uh, put it in that folder as well. So Eric is happy. It's time for him for a Belgian beer. Eh? Uh, so he could a little bit uh, rest. So that, it was a lot in this uh, session. So what are the most important things you, you should uh, remember? Is in the first place, um, well, before you can start, you need to own a public uh, domain. And uh, uh, this is an important one that is often forgotten. TLS SSL is more than uh, just encryption. It's also about trust, trusting that that server belongs to my company and not by another uh, entity. Uh, you have to uh, know how we can buy an uh, SSL certificate. That the standard TLS configuration of a machine, and especially an old machine, is not enough. You have to patch it and to update it to stay secure. Um, and that's maybe the most important one that I want to give you. Use always the latest version of FileMaker Server and the FileMaker clients. Don't keep your solution in FileMaker 14 or 15 or whatever. Stay today, up to date. That's the, an important one to uh, stay secure. And don't forget to secure a FileMaker solution. And last but not least, choose the right hosting that fits you. And uh, I had to change the slides since this morning because uh, FileMaker Cloud first, so it must be on the, the left side. So look to that option because they do a lot of all the issues we run in today and on my session. You don't have that on FileMaker Cloud. Farmic resolving that issue for you. Okay. I want to thank you. It's time for a Q&A. So if anyone has uh, questions, please uh, raise. Okay, thank you. There will be uh, speakers updates or uh, session updates. Uh, okay, thank you. I have a question. Yes. Uh, it's just 
I saw you said FileMaker ID was um, a pro and con uh, on one of your earlier slides. Yes, um, it's 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 an it's a pro if you uh, you're new to the platform, but if you have already a system with a lot of uh, users, or you want to rely on um, uh, other odd things that will be not available in the first version of uh, of FileMaker Pro. So if you maybe uh, um, using uh, Windows Azure uh, uh, ID, for instance, that will not be compatible in, uh, in, FileMaker, uh, in FileMaker Cloud for the first uh, release. Okay, just to clarify, when you say FileMaker ID, that's um, you, a, a local account and password? Yeah, uh, local accounts, uh, for what I have tested, doesn't work in FileMaker Cloud. You have to use FileMaker Cloud. But maybe that will change when the product uh, is released. But more, there's a session tomorrow morning at 11 o'clock about uh, the ins and outs of uh, FileMaker Cloud. So uh, I encourage you to have a look to it. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you.